Hi everyone and welcome to my channel. Today we're talking about four books that I've found interesting and helpful whether it be in lifestyle trends, finances or just the way that we look at the world. So hang in with me and we'll discuss each book briefly. There are four of them so let's get started. The first book is called Lifespan why We Age and Why We Don't Have To by David Sinclair. Now, if you look at this book, you think, hmm, I know why Sonia's interested in this book because she's an older, she's female, and she's worried about her looks. Well, you would only be half right because the other reason is because I actually am interested and living a longer healthy life and that's what I want for you guys as well and that's why I have a YouTube channel that focuses on areas that can make us be more vital more healthy and give you tips so uh, the other reason is because David Sinclair who's the researcher who actually wrote the book is uh, is from Harvard and well well known um, he's cutting edge and guess what? He's Australian and since I am as well and we're recording this here in Australia, you know, what's not to love about that? So he's one of our own. We'd like to claim those people. Um, people doing great work and, and in health is always a great thing. So what D Dr. Sinclair suggests is that aging is the disease. So we view diseases as part of aging. What he is suggesting is that aging as we grow older is the disease and with that comes those other things. So this is a very different concept to how we see aging. And, you know, um, I think the fact that instead of publishing his journals and his studies, well, his studies in journals and in scientific sites, he has actually published a book first, which makes it available to the people. And so that you and I can actually read what his studies were and what he found and his suggestions before scientists and other researchers. How good's that? And that's not usually how things are done. But, you know, we're in a new era of media and information sharing. So I think this is a great way where, so, so have a look at it. It's a great book. Um, he suggests that treating aging, we can reverse its process. So his studies are showing that they can reverse aging's process. And he foresees a future where, you know, there won't be people with um, mobility deficits, uh, dementia, cancer, Parkinson's. These are all diseases of old age is what he's saying. So, and, and he, what, what the book says is that aging is just a loss of information to our cells. If we can put that information back into the cells, it can regenerate and ta-ta, we don't age. Aging's reversed. So interesting, you know, his mice studies, uh, he's damaged, they, they do a study where the optic nerve, nerve of the mice, are, are, pinched or clipped which causes the mouth mice to go blind not very nice but you know uh, and then the mice are given particular drugs and the optic nerve regenerates within seven days now this has never been done before and just opens the door to so much um, technology and a futuristic um, improvements in health and you know in seeing uh, in regeneration of um, 
you, uh, nerves for spinal spinal injuries as well. It's just huge. It's it, it's just opening the way for a whole new world of uh, an age where we don't walk around old and decrepit. You know, sorry if that sounds offensive, but you know, as aging people. You know, we keep our vitality, we're able to move, we're able to interact with others, we can work longer, we can mentor people, we can play with grandkids, we can watch our families and support our families for longer and be here to, you know, be socially connected to other people. So these are all great things. So he also talks about simple measures that increase longevity. And these are the such things as, the food we eat, so, you know, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, eating less things like meat, dairy and sugar um, by reducing calories. So eating things like either reducing your calories or doing something like intermittent fasting and that need not be like fast for three days, although if you're able to do that, studies show that that's really good. Um, but it's eating normal portions of food, but just extending the time frames that you do it. So for example, if I ate my last meal at 6 p.m. at night, normally if I would get up and have uh, breakfast at 6 a.m., instead of having breakfast, skipping breakfast until say like 10 o'clock, because that way, uh, from 6 to 6 is 12 hours, to 10 is another 4. Okay, so I have now fasted then for 16 hours and it makes your cells utilize information better. So um, intermittent fasting is another area. Um, how we move, how many steps a day or how much movement we do. Uh, and this, you know, he, Dr. Sinclair actually uses um, trackable devices and he actually wears an aura ring similar to this one. And this I talked about in my video in January. And the aura ring helps um, measure your sleep patterns and your sleep quality. It also helps um, measure your activity and your um, base metabolic rate. It also includes in that data. So um, it's very good. So I've enjoyed having this data uh, since wearing it or having it since Christmas. So that's a good thing. Um, the other thing is that Australia is leading the charge into defining aging as a treatable disease. So it actually means for Australia that we may be the very first people who develop drugs here uh, that actually help with that. So this is all happening and it's exciting and you know new health research that comes out uh, is great. Um, he mentions what he does to on page 304 what he does to actually improve his lifestyle and you know it's you know wearing his bio tracker it's knowing his BMI and again as I said first video in January check it out it's about you know um, having vitamins such as uh, vitamin daily dose of vitamin D and K and aspirin 83 milligrams of aspirin a day he talks about having one gram of resveratrol eating minimal sugar um, he suggests that metformin may be an anti-aging drug and that uh, a, a, a molecule such as NMN, and you'll have to read the book to find out what that is, is also very good. Hard to access, but very good. The NMN, that is. So have a look at it. It's a good book, good read, and a lot of information in here. I can't say it's an easy read because, of course, there's lots of long words. There's the studies. Um, so, you know, it's read some, put it away, read some, take notes, highlight. Highlighters are my friend. I love highlighters. 
Another book to read is Live More Happy by Dr. Darren Morton. And this is a simple and easy to read book on improving general health and your lifestyle. So it only takes a few hours to get through. Um, you can order it online. Um, and it's just a good way of improving your health. Sometimes some of the things you read, you go, oh, that's right, I should be doing that. Or, yeah, that's right. So it's some of the things we already know, um, but puts it into a more practical aspect. Um, so it touches on different aspects of health. Um, and a lot of the data that have come from um, Dan Bootner's book, Blue Zone, um, has identified areas you know that we need to be concentrating on and this is things like sleep movement what we eat um, how connected we are so good book easy read the next book that I'd like to talk to you about is called Fatfulness and it's by Hans Rosling and if you've ever seen any of his TED talks he's the dude that actually, you know, grabs the balls and put graphs them on the graph. And he's, it's a very good, he's very good. I'll, I'll link one of his um, TED Talks below. Very visual way of presenting data. And what, what he suggests is that, you know, often we think that the world or the things that have been implemented are not effective and that we need to do something grand and something better. But in reality, the world is better than what we think. And the media and the way that they present or, or how things are presented uh, often suggests otherwise. So... When asked a simple question about a global trend, what percentage of the world are living in poverty, why the global population is increasing, how many girls finish school a year, um, we all get the answers wrong. So wrong, he says, that a chimpanzee choosing answers at random will consistently outguess journalists, Nobel laureates, and investment bankers. Well, that says a lot, doesn't it? So, sorry if I've offended any of those people in my video. So the world is better shaped than we think. Uh, and sometimes we can lose our ability to focus on the good things or the things that need attention rather than when everything around us gets mixed up in that, that mucky data. So... He says, uh, Hans suggests that lonely numbers, so numbers by themselves, are to be avoided. Never leave a number by itself. Always compare it to something else. Or if a number's reported, then think, oh, well, what is the data surrounding that? Or what could that be? And he gives an example of UNICEF uh, that reported in 2016 that something like 4.2 million babies die a year globally and you know this is a terrible amount babies dying sh is a horrible thing uh, and I guess it tugs at the at people's heartstrings and that's reporting is what it's meant to do however we can feel like oh we're not making a difference but in fact if you compared that number to the year before that number was 4.4 million and the year before that, it was 4.5 million. And if you tracked it back to 1950, it was 14.4 million children die a year. So suddenly the numbers start to seem less. In fact, the numbers are the lowest they've been since measuring began. So there is an impact of what we're doing. You know, we are doing things that are taking, that are, are able to be measured. So improvement is happening. Um, he also talks about the swine flu in 2009 and how thousands of people died. However, unlike Ebola in 2014, the cases did not double. However, journalists kept the fear boiling for weeks 
And we can also see this with the coronavirus and how it's reported and how it keeps, you know, it, it, it's um, making people fearful. Um, here in Australia, we have shopping centres that are bereft of things like um, certain types of food like pasta, um, there's no tissues on the shelves at the moment and there's no toilet paper. And it's because people are becoming frenzied. They're buying, buying, buying to store because they're fearful. However, you can check out my previous video and it talks about prevention tips for viral illnesses. And these tips are the same, these prevention tips are the same things that you know, the World Health Organization has put out to prevent transmission of disease and the Center for Disease Control. So have a look at that, check out my previous video. Um, back to Hans now. Hans goes on to write, he got tired of the hysteria of swine flu and he calculated that the rate of news reports versus fatalities. So over a period of two weeks, because you know if you're a person with numbers, this, this is your thing. Over a period of two weeks, 31 people died from swine flu and, new, and a new search on Google brought up like something like 253,442 articles. That was like 8,176 articles per death, which works out to be 82,000 times more attention to equally tragic news of death from TB, which kills roughly 63,066 people in a two-week time zone. And TB or tuberculosis, it's an infection, it can be treated. However, it can also become resistant and is still a threat. But we don't report on it. So it's all about the numbers. It's an interesting book to help you put numbers in perspective. It also talks about, um, does a, a bit of a graphing of, you know, the Western world won't be the wealthy Western world anymore. Um, and so if you're interested in knowing where to invest, what's going to happen in the future, have a little read of this book. It's a good read. Okay, so the fourth book that we're getting to is talking about finances and it's the Barefoot Invest, sorry, it's the Barefoot Investor by Scott Pappy or Pape, however you want to say it. Um, I've had this for, oh, I don't know, a few years now, um, but there are newer editions because they've been updated uh, and there's also a children's book for kids uh, and you know the information is simple it talks about going on date nights with your partner which is a good time to go out anyway um, that way and, and talk about finances and plan your finances and have a structure to planning and dealing with your money you know taking stock saving whatever getting rid of credit cards so I, I, I you, you know we call people who follow this method that Scott suggests as barefoot investors and I'm one of them and I have found it very good you know I've got rid of my credit card not that I never paid it monthly anyway um, but p purchasing things on credit card I've stopped um, I have my accounts bank accounts set up into an everyday account I also have a splurge account so I use that particular account for things like coffees, meals, um, clothes, whatever. Once that money's gone, it's gone. If there's money left in the account, then it, you know, that's all good. I've got more next fortnight to play with. Um, I also have a smile account and why it's called a smile account is something that makes you happy when you think of it. So a holiday that you could be um, planning for. Uh, or a boob job, a car, I don't know. Um, so it's something that you're saving for and it's a slow save because it's a fortnightly thing. So if you paid fortnightly, it's like divvying up percentages of your income 
into these certain accounts. And then the last account is the Mojo account and it is effectively three months of your savings or your earnings saved into one account. So that if something happens, you lose a job, you lose your property through fire, uh, or there's some emergency, family emergency that you have to go overseas for or interstate with, you've got money there to be able to do that. So it's a very good book. Um, I highly recommend it. It's a great gift to give to uh, other people, no matter what age. You know, we all struggle with finance and saving. Uh, and if you're thinking of retirement as well, then there's a whole section on retiring and how much money you need. I think sometimes, um, and it says this in the book, we think we have to have, you know, a million dollars set aside for, our, you know, in our super fund for us to retire on. That's not true. I'm happy to tell you, Scott says it's not true. Um, so have a read of the book. It's very helpful. Uh, Scott's doing a lot to help educate children in Australia. He has um, a, a, a saving system set up in schools for certain schools who have, you know, um, wanted the program. He is currently a, doing um, counselling to those affected by fire. So he's a financial counsellor for in areas that have been fire affected from our bushfires here in Australia. So he's doing that and as a victim himself of having his property and house burnt in fires a number of years ago, he actually knows what it's like, knows what they need uh, and can help them deal with insurance companies and finance companies during this very stressful time of loss. Uh, he also has a passion for it and it's very obvious in the way in what he's doing and where his focus continues to be driven and you know what what products he is actually um, putting out into the public arena that can help other people as well so his motto is tread your own path and that is you can do that when you have everything in place and you, you might be doing things different from the other person. You're not buying you know, a new car or a house that you can't afford and living beyond your means. But you know what? We all have our own path to tread, whether it's in health, how we live and lifestyle and what we save and spend our money on. So I suggest you tread your own path, be smart, use information well, and I hope you've enjoyed today's video. Um, thanks for subscribing, and I'll see you next week. Bye.